So I'm going to apologise, or not apologise, forewarn you that I don't use PowerPoint or screens or anything. Considering like my topic is something incredibly photogenic, like the end of the world, I don't really tend to use much media. So you're going to have to put up with my accent and me um, half reading off sheets of paper in front of you and sitting in front of the camera. So I'm not going to move around a lot. So it's not going to be a very dynamic session until David starts and then we all pile in on him as though he were Richard Spencer. So, that was only a joke for two or three people, sorry. <laughs> all right. So what I tend to work on is catastrophe. Um, and what I want to do, I suppose it's quite a, it's a, it's a topical topic, if we're going to go with that. Um, considering we're faced with the election of Trump in the US, um, so this wave of reactionary xenophobia that's been unleashed by Brexit, it'd be easy to think that the world came to a, a, a hideous end in 2016. Um, and to think that, you know, we're suddenly living through end times. The problem is that the world's been ending for, I guess, at least a decade now. It's almost a decade the world's been ending. I don't think there's been a year in the last 10 years where someone hasn't said the end of the world is nigh, or that things are as bad as it could possibly be, or that we're in the midst of a catastrophe. And because we could mark it from about 2008, the onset of the Great Recession, it's like nothing really takes hold as a historical event. Nothing seems to have any traction. Nothing, nothing seems memorable. It's almost like everything after the Great Recession um, is taking place in some sort of state of amnesia where uh, nothing seems significant, or at least it doesn't seem worth remembering. Now, uh, I'm far, far from the first person to suggest that we're living through a period of time where nothing seems to take place, where um, you know, it's the Gramscian sense of like, you know, the old is dying but the new is yet to be born. Now, an author I want to return to, uh, Lauren Bryant, suggests that we're in the midst of a particular kind of period, period marked by impasse, um, a stretch of time when nothing seems to happen, where, where moments never seem to make their way into a space of event, that nothing seems historical. Um, and this is, you know, in, in a way to say that we're now after the future. <coughs> uh, Biffo's line that we're after the future, that uh, the moments or the, the situations that transpire never seem to cohere into sort of a full or, 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 or sort of frothing crises that can be resolved. And once resolved, then we can move on from them into, into the future. So, you know, crisis, you know, to manifest events as crises so we can make history. Now, on paper, ecological catastrophe promises you know, to be substantive and real, to be a proper event. Um, and it's, it's tempting when faced with the litany of facts around climate change or mass extinction or rubbish, you know, islands of rubbish in the ocean to, to, to thump the table and say that this is real, this is really catastrophic, this is really the end. Yet awareness of climate change has been slowly building for about 100 years now and it's been properly catastrophic for a good 10, if not 15 years. It's, it's, it's easy to go back and look at the newspapers and sort of say people have been talking about climate change as though it's the end of the world for a, a decade and a half now. And it's not really actually an event either, if you want to put it that way. It's more of a, uh, a slow unraveling across the face of the earth. It's not really a photogenic disaster, it's slow violence. And it, that it, in a sense, it needs to be narrated into an event for us to even take hold of it. Still, you know, staying with the theme, we could say that processes like, um, like climate change um, they're not smooth or even, they're, they're marked by thresholds and boundaries and tipping points that can be said to stand in for events or probably historical moments. Yet, for the past decade and a half, there's been a constant litany or sort of accounting for these moments and thresholds and deadlines that we have to come up against and, and, and tackle and solve if we're going to resolve climate change as a problem. Yet, they come and they go and they pass us by. There's, there's a, a, a constant, there's a backstory, there's a an endless list of disasters that happened before now, yet the catastrophe goes on. So what I want to do um, with the presentation um, this afternoon is sort of work through this unending catastrophe that is climate change. Um, in particular, I want to focus on the question of why environmentalism doesn't seem to be able to take hold of it as a problem. Um, why environmentalism seems like it can't really do very much at all about climate change. 
I want to do that by working with an absence. And that absence is the, uh, the title of the, the presentation people are disappointing. I actually can't remember the rest of the title of that sentence, but I'm sure I went on to say something else quite witty and intelligent and, and you know, obviously quite funny. But I want to start with the absence of people. In particular, I want to start with the absence of a mass um, social movement against climate change. Or at least the absence of an effective movement against climate change. Now, I'll set out a few sort of, um, I guess, definitions before we get going. So when I when I mean when I say impasse, that there's an impasse in environmental politics. What I mean is, oh, well, I mean two things. The first is that existing campaign strategies and tactics that are ineffective for resolving the problem. They haven't arrested climate change, and it's unlikely that they will do. I also mean that there doesn't appear to be any other way of tackling climate change other than using those campaigns, strategies and tactics that aren't working. So it's a double bind. Now, as I'm going to argue, um, this state of impasse is, is very particular and it's born from um, the unraveling or dying of a particular political tradition, uh, um, the liberal political tradition, and the characteristics of climate change as a problem. So it's born from the collision of these two. All right. So, in terms of definitions, let's start with climate change. Um, all right, I'm sure everybody's really knows everything there is to know about climate change, but I'm going to run through it anyway. Just as, I guess it's a scholarly tick you have to do as you move through these things. So climate change is a, is a term uh, to capture the damage done by human activity to the Earth's carbon cycle over the past 200 years. Um, through use of fossil fuels and deforestation primarily, what's happened is that the, the Earth's climate, that's the, so the, the aggregate of the weather systems of the Earth as sort of measured over historical time, have been radically disrupted. Uh, this disruption is not a one-time one event, but rather it's a process of destabilization and transformation. Now, the predictions, scientific predictions of what will happen because of climate change are quite catastrophic and alarming. Um, now, so I'm sure most people have heard uh, some of the, the list of consequences, but I'm gonna do a bit of a quick civilization kicks the bucket list. Um, of what happens if we uh, inflict on the Earth's biosphere a, a two degree Celsius increase in global average temperatures. Two degrees being sort of the internationally recognized uh, danger point. Um, so what we'll see, um, probably by around 2080, is about a meter of sea level rise, uh, swamping coastal cities and causing hundreds of millions of people to be displaced. Um, most uh, major cities in um, I couldn't even begin to list most of the major cities that we affected. Think of all the east coast and west coast of the US, um, most of the coast of Europe, a lot of the main cities in England, um, pretty much all of Australia. It'll still leave some beaches, so I guess it's no great loss. Um, uh, and then that's just to start with. Then you can start thinking about the countries and the cities that are going to be enveloped where there's fewer economic resources to manage. <coughs> Two degrees will um, undermine and reduce crop yields in many places around the world, many places that are considered the bread baskets. So the earth reducing crop yields on average by between 20 and 30 percent. So that's 20 to 30 percent less food. Um, it will reduce freshwater supplies, uh, glaciers will disappear, rainfall patterns will shift. There'll be uh, more and more, in, more, more frequent and more intense storms. Um, Disruptions of sort of rainfall patterns coupled with increased surface temperatures will cause deserts to spread, including to southern Europe. Um, as temperatures change, biomes will collapse, uh, the great current uh, mass extinction that's underway will intensify, uh, oceans will acidify, and coral reefs will disappear. Now, this is two degrees. This is um, what we're aiming for currently. It's not what we're on track for. What we're on track for is somewhere between three to four degrees. Three to four degrees to senior sense isn't double that. We're talking more of an exponential curve of damage to the biosphere. So think, well, think logarithmically, so it's much, much worse. Now, okay, that sounds bad. It's not that bad, it's okay. Um, now, climate change as a problem has a, a number of specific characteristics that make it in terms of a political object. Um, 
Firstly, it's global. It's not bound to any one place anywhere. Um, rather, it takes place everywhere all at once. The second following from this is that it's a sticky problem. It's a product of the global economy, so it's not produced in any one place either. Um, the consequence of this is that in order to tackle climate change, it appears like you need to change everything everywhere. Um, now, there are any number of solutions to climate change that will make people's lives better in whatever place they take the, the changes are made. This is not what I mean by you need to change everything. Rather, piecemeal solutions to climate change appear as ineffective. Now, just these two characteristics tend to mean that when people think of solutions to climate change, what they imagine are um, blueprints, vast blueprints for reorganizing um, life, the economy, um, belief systems, patterns of consumption everywhere. You see vast schemas for the reorganization of life, at least in the global north. Now there's a third characteristic to climate change, and then, and then I mentioned this before, in that while climate change is a, a continuum of transformation via biosphere, um, it has a number of, you know, it's described as having a number of sort of thresholds, boundaries, and tipping points, sort of markers that distinguish what we consider just bad climate change from properly catastrophic climate change. Now, crucially, the deadline for arresting climate change at no more than two degrees. So that list before was the best case scenario. So just that, just realizing that, the deadline for it, well, technically it was probably last year, but we could probably just say now and fudge a bit. Um, so the deadline's now, so it has to, it's not, you know, we don't, don't increase the rate of global greenhouse gases. It's not that we hold them where they are, it's that from now we start to decrease our carbon emissions. Now the threshold for uh, dangerous climate change is two degrees. Uh, there's some controversy around this. Uh, it's um, increasingly believed that the threshold for dangerous climate change is one and a half degrees, which is too bad because we've kind of missed that. But you know, we can still hold it at two. To give you a sense of the scale of change required in order to keep global temperature, global warming to two degrees, um, Carbon emissions, global carbon emissions, we need to peak this year and go into decline from this year by between 5 and 6% for about 15 years. Now, carbon emissions um, are not uncontroversially coupled to economic activity. So, the more economic activity you have, the more carbon emissions you have. If you want to decrease carbon emissions, it's generally accepted you need to decrease economic activity. Put this in perspective, to reduce economic activity by between, by between 5 and 6% is the same as, well, it's the same sort of contraction that was experienced by the, um, the now ex Soviet states when the USSR collapsed, except it'd be, a deliberate cry, it'd be a deliberate crunch of economic activity and for twice as long. So it's, it's quite a substantive contraction. All right. So that. Um, climate change is a massive global problem requiring transforming everything, everywhere, rapidly, is in itself not the problem. That's, that sounds bad, but there are endless numbers of uh, heroic science-based action plans for changing everything and turning the world around on a dime. Um, I mean, there's, there's actually a, a history, sort of a minor history of uh, of fiction and movies that you always have a scientist as a, as a protagonist that seems to do impossible things. I think the most recent one was The Martian, where um, was it? I didn't even know Matt Damon's character. But the, have people seen The Martian? Mm -hmm. yeah. This guy's stuck on Mars <clears throat> and he's got like dirt and his own feces and some potatoes and he has to live for a year and a half. And he just, what he does is he sciences the shit out of things. He sciences the problem, just works it, solves the problem, moves on. It's like this heroic narrative of the scientist as savior. The science of savior, you know, the scientist of savior exists as a figure, and there are plans. There are bookstore bargain bins full of plans. Plans are the problem. The problem is that there's no one capable, or no actor capable, of implementing a single solution to climate change. Or at least it doesn't appear that way. So this brings me to the question of the politics of environmentalism. 
Alright. So despite there being a host of minoritarian, minoritarian currents within sort of environmental um, practice in the global north, and I'm going to talk about the global north, not the global south. I think in the global south it's a, it's a very different um, context, but also in many ways a, a different set of problems. Most of the people I worked with when I was doing um, international climate change work in the global south didn't even focus on climate change as a problem. They focused on extractive industries, they focused on GMOs and um, mega, like, uh, mega infrastructure projects like dams. There's a, a host of other problems. And so the, the object of my talk is the uh, environmentalists in the global north. Um, there's a, in the global north, there's a host of minoritarian um, currents uh, within environmental politics. But by and large, environmental politics, at least since the late 1970s, um, has, you could characterize it as holding to um, a very egalitarian, liberal political tradition. Um, now, I would say that sort of it's probably fair to characterize environmentalism as part of a general turn or a general consolidation of, of liberal political, um, of liberal politics after um, the emergence of the New Left in the 1960s and 1970s. Like much of the pol political landscape we encounter among social movements post sort of mid to late 1970s is firmly housed within a, a liberal framework. <coughs> I think that, that's marked by the shift to an orientation around democracy as the objective of um, radical politics rather than, say, communism or socialism or um, uh, any of the other host of political traditions that, or um, utopias that we get aim for. Now, by uh, liberalism, I mean the political tradition that brings together a notion of um, individual sovereignty uh, around rights-based personhood. Um, and the idea that the role of the state is to secure the freedoms of individuals on a formally egalitarian basis. Now, the framework for, liberal, uh, for, for liberalism as a political tradition is uh, a particular historical narrative of um, technology facilitated progress. So, technology uh, and the growth of technology and the, and the growth of the capacity and power of technology enables a sense of historical progress. Um, coupled to which there's a, a, a sense of liberation, or it's animated by a spirit of liberation, not just from drudgery, but also from unreason. So this is uh, particularly expressed through an adherence to science as the means by which um, we acquire knowledge around the world and then we put that knowledge into action. So if science, reason, liberates us from uh, superstition, religion, drudgery, uh, the, the capricious nature of nature. Now, while history is full of crowds and mobs, within this tradition there are two basic political actors. There's the individual and, and the various associations of individuals where people come together to, to, to enhance their power as sovereign individuals, and there's the state. Now, it, it's, it's not that difficult to track sort of a, a, a setting up of the individual and the state against um, uh, unrestrained desire and the intimacy of the mob. Like the mob quite often figures is this is this mass that threatens both the individual and the, and the reasonable governance of the state. And you find this um, articulated in modern environmental thought um, through two actors. We have the activist or the active citizen, because that's what an activist is in a sense. It's just an active citizen, um, and a particular iteration of the state as a instrument of rational governance that mobilizes scientific fact. So it's governance by fact. Now I did say I start with an absence, and I know this is a very long beginning, but I'm going to get to the absence now. Um, for the better part of a decade, there have been persistent, for the entire history of climate change as a catastrophe, there's been calls, sustained calls for, uh, for people to take to the streets, for there to be a, a, a mass climate change movement. Capable of, uh, sorry, one capable of forcing government and business alike to take climate change seriously and to start to implement some of these blueprints for transforming the global economy. Now, arguably, one emerged. Uh, the largest climate change movement in the global north um, was here in the UK. More or less, you can say, between 2005 and 2011, maybe 2012, there was what has been the largest climate change movement in the global north. And by movement, I mean a sustained 
uh, agitation and organisation around an issue. Now there were um, a number of significant uh, non-governmental organisation campaigns, uh, a huge array of um, community and activist organisations. There were uh, union, for everyone from church groups to unions were involved in agitating on the issue. There was massive media coverage for this period of time. Um, uh, there were very large and sort of uh, well-known protest camps that took place between 2006 and 2010. There was. Um, and this period of time, sort of, I guess you could say that while there was like, um, quite literally hundreds of thousands of people who sort of expressed sentiments or positive sentiments around doing something about climate change, there was like a core group of several thousand people involved in actively campaigning and organising around the climate change <coughs> issue. So that doesn't really sound like an absence. I understand that calling that an absence is probably um, a bit excessive. But I'd like to argue that it, is, it does denote a kind of absence. Its very presence marks an absence of efficacy. And I'm going to get to why that's important. The UK movement, in, in at least one sense, never involved more than a few thousand people. So you can, you can say it involved thousands of people, you can say it never involved more than thousands of people. And what I want to say is it never involved more than a few thousand people. Um, and as such, it never quite got to the size or scale required in order to force business to act or force government to take action, or at least not effective action. Now, the movement that immediately preceded the climate change movement was the anti-globalisation movement. This lasted for twice as long and involved some, by some estimates, up to 10 times as many people. Um, and I'm not going to get to the, the, how, how effective this organisation, that this, this the anti globalisation was or wasn't. I just want to mark that there's, you know, there's a movement just prior to the climate change movement that was much larger and lasted for longer. Now, the size, or I guess the lack of size, of the climate change movement is important precisely because it failed as a movement. It fell in the sense that despite a few symbolic victories and what I'll describe as a rather ineffective climate change law, um, it never really addressed the problem of climate change. Now it can be said that this is unfair. Probably would be said that it's unfair. Um, that it's business's fault, that it's government's fault, that um, it's unrealistic or unreasonable to assume that a, a social movement could do anything about climate change. This is precisely my point. So what is it that failed about the movement if it, if it didn't do anything about climate change? So what is it that failed? Well, I think you know, it's a bit of a leading question because obviously I'm going to say that it's about the size. Um, now one argument that can be made is that it never quite reached the size that it needed to have the weight that was required in order to force government's hand or to um, act autonomous from the, uh, autonomously from the government and start to implement changes uh, without legislation or policy. And that's a there's a particular scale of logic to that, but one that is easily found in most of the calls um, for a climate change movement amongst uh, NGOs, activists, journalists. Um, commentators, like there's, there's, there were innumerable calls, and still are innumerable calls, for a, a mass movement. And then the logic behind it is quite simple. Um, climate change is global, it requires changing everything, it requires changing everything fast, and so what you need is a movement so big that you can either create the change itself or just force government to do it. So it has to be a, a substantive and, in a sense, um, inescapable um, social power. And size gives you that. It's the, the size is the, the, the key to efficacy. Um, it means you're either big enough to, to, to force change or implement it on your own without recourse to anything else. All right, so if that's the problem, then the question is quite simple, is why weren't more people involved? I mean, you know, just prior to this, there was a, a, a much larger mass movement, so where did everybody go? Um, I mean, you could also you could take it a bit further and, and ask, you know, why weren't people more concerned about climate change? Um, 
you can go even further. Why does it seem like more people are scared of migrants than out of the four degree future? Like, to be honest, like the UK swamped with migrants, the UK swamped with mega storms and deserts. Like, I'm, one's slightly more catastrophic than the other. So why afraid of some plumber from Syria, but not like a, a Category 5 uh, uh, hurricane bearing down on London. I mean, we've all seen the day after tomorrow in 2012. We've all seen the photogenic disaster. That's the difference. All right. So I want to symptomatically approach these questions. And I'll start with um, an intuition of one of the more prominent uh, writer activists in the UK, George Monbiot. Um, now, he argued. Um, back in 2007, that climate change politics would face a problem. One that would work against it or mitigate against it, mobilising or being able to mobilise large numbers of people. Now, the problem as he saw it was the solution to climate change or the apparent solution to climate change. Now, climate change is caused by um, carbon emissions, greenhouse gases. So, to solve climate change or at least arrest it, you need to reduce carbon emissions, you need to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases you put into the atmosphere. As I mentioned before, that means reducing economic activity. Monbiot's point was that, at least in the global north, economic activity means consumption. So when you're really talking about reducing economic activity, you really mean reducing consumption. Now this is not a, a, a far out statement, this is a really common statement amongst environmental activists. What Monbiot argues the problem is, is that if you're campaigning for people to reduce their consumption, you're effectively campaigning for austerity. You're campaigning for people to have less stuff. And he says that the character that this takes on is, it means that what we're campaigning for, at least in the global north, is that we're campaigning against ourselves. And that's the nature of the climate change campaign. All right, so who's not here talking about here? There's plenty of people who haven't got very much stuff at all and, and don't really consume much. So, Who's he talking about? Well, he's, he starts out talking about you and me, the uh, consumers in the global north. Globally speaking, uh, we're relatively wealthy. Now, the bind as Mongo sees is that he campaigns, environmental campaigns need to convince people like us to, to you know, there's no more beach holidays in the Caribbean, there's no more cocktails, like, you know, we don't get to own a car, we don't get to have a big screen TV, like we kind of have to give up on having cool stuff. Yeah. Have to share things, you know. No more private libraries, everyone has to check their laptop in and hot desk and lots of stuff. It's terrible, I imagine. No more iPad. That sounds, you know, you can almost stretch and go, well, if we have to, we have to. We're, we can make the sacrifice, we can all have like, um, we can collectivise everything and it'll be fun and maybe it'll just be like, you know, a dorm living at college or something. Except Mommy wants to, to say something, he wants to indicate something, he wants to, to mark something by saying it's a campaign against ourselves. He's making a claim about subjectivity, the subjectivity of the consumer. Being a consumer is not only a problem because of the ecological effects of consumption, we're, you know, with climate change we're quite literally consuming the world. Um, it's a problem because the consumer wants to consume. It's a, an addiction, an insatiable desire. It's a compulsive subjective state to consume. A consumer is someone who consumes. That's, the, the, that's a, an expression of a, a central part of a, a sort of modern identity in the global north. Now, in Mombu's line of argument, again, it's fair to say it expresses a current thought in environmental politics. The consumer is both the problem and the solution. The consumer is the solution because it's our consumption that causes climate change. So what we need to do is, you know, stop it. Just reduce what we consume. Seems an easy enough start in some ways. It's a problem because people don't want to give up their stuff. People don't want to have less. So if we bring this back to the question before about where, you know, why weren't more people mobilised, they sort of say, well, the people weren't there because people were out shopping. <laughs> now, I'm going to make, I'm, I keep making asides and caveats, I'm going to make another one now, that there is obviously a glaring problem with this characterisation of climate change. Um, and I don't want anyone to think that's my characterisation of climate change, it's not, it's not my fault, I didn't come up with it. 
the, it's apparent even from the logic of um, environmental politics and the orientation of the state is that climate change isn't a product of consumption, it's a product of a, a mode of production, of a, it's a product of the global economy. You don't change it by consuming less, you change it by changing how things are produced and, how, and the organisation of the material resources of society and how they're distributed. Consumption is used, it's interesting that the consumption is used as a proxy for climate change quite often. You know, carbon footprint, carbon budget, um, carbon offsets when we fly and all the rest of it. As an explanation for climate change, it's terrible. As a reason for condemning humanity, it's fantastic. So it's just worth noting how consumption operates in this logic here. Alright, we'll skip across a little bit and talk about science and, and facts. Um, now almost all environmental movements um, work through mobilizations of science. Um, from DDT to climate change, uh, environmental cam campaigns are quite often combinations of scientific facts, images of doom, you know, of the future, but often created out of scientific predictions or scenarios. Quite often these images of doom are very grounded in, in scientific research. Um, and often there's also a third element, which is sort of a, a, an appeal to empathy with a more than human world. Though with climate change, we don't often find that. You know, it's, sort of, it's almost like it's tapped on at the end. It's like we have doom, destruction, human extinction, oh yeah, don't forget the polar bears. But, you know, the polar bears are in there, but often it's, we're talking about scientifically grounded claims. Um, so, you know, campaigns around climate change start with the facts. This is global warming. Uh, this is what's going to happen. It's all peer-reviewed, it's all good, no, it's all bad, but you know, the science is all good. Um, and then you know, the campaigns move on to the blueprints, you know, to solutions grounded in science and technology. And the enemy of environmental politics is often said to be denial of the facts, um, whether this be born from uh, sort of an irrational um, response to the threat of losing your stuff, or it's the fault of a denial industry or um, uh, or politicians that set out to like you know to, to to consolidate their grip on power through alt facts and post truth politics. Now, underneath environmental politics is a particular notion of political agency, and we can sort of get a glimpse of it um, if we bring together the facticity of environmental politics and sort of Monbiot's intuition what the problem with climate change politics is. The idea of, that often animates environmental campaigns is that knowledge produces power. I mean, this is not environmentalism, this is a, this is a basis for liberal politics. Knowledge, um, uh, the, the acquisition of knowledge produces capacities and in, in an in informed, uh, in, in informed citizenry that are then capable of politics. Um, politics, in a sense, is produced through education. This is how liberalism has evolved over the past, I guess, 150 years. Um, we could even say that liberalism as a political tradition is characterised by its commitment to pedagogy as a means of making people capable of politics. Now, there's a literature here on, in terms of, you know, a vast literature in, in terms of how people are made capable of politics and how politics is created as a a sphere separate from everyday life. Um, and it's interesting that the last time there was a, 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 any sort of sizable de-schooling movement was in the 1970s, just prior to, sort of, I guess, the period of ascendancy of liberal politics. I want to focus on um, one aspect of education, the role of education as it pertains to Monbiot's insight. And that's how education is often seen, seen as a way of creating the capacity for self-restraint. Right, so Monbiot's idea is that a climate change campaign requires a campaign against ourselves and that the problem with this, with this is that people won't want to give up their stuff. Now he expands on this by saying, you know, it's in his, his book Heat, um, he has this, a few pages of this whole lament where he's like, oh, even my environmentalist friends, they have their aggers and their Prius cars and they're just consumerists like everybody else and they take their like zero carbon trips to Costa Rica to see the funky monkeys and stuff like that and like, this is terrible, all these environmentalists know all the science, and yet they still travel and consume. 
I mean, it's terrible. He, he, these are environmentalists, and like, they know the science, and they still won't give up their stuff. You know, what's, what's gone wrong here? What's the problem? Okay, the role of education is to, to shape people into political agents, to give them the capacities and the information to act responsibly. That's the key word there. That's what information does. That's what, the, that's what you know, being educated does. It makes you capable of being responsible as a citizen. I mean, an active citizen is just a responsible citizen. It's our duty to respond to uh, the Muslim ban, for instance, or to um, the rise of xenophobia in the streets, or to threats against democracy. That's what an active citizen and a responsible citizen does. Now, we should remember that education has always been a gate through which one entered citizenship. It's also been a gate closed to many people. Education has been used to exclude people from full and active citizenship. Um, Quite on the basis that people are either in, uh, incapable of learning or incapable probably, of controlling their desires. This is the influence of Val Tumble in this argument quite succinctly around uh, the role of patriarchy and colonialism in cementing a portion of humanity as incapable of reason and therefore incapable of full citizenship. So, you know, historically it's been women in the working classes, poor people, um, children, migrants. Uh, black and indigenous people, all these people are seen as less capable of self-restraint. And so, in a sense, incapable or not worthy of full citizenship. Now, environmentalism, again, it, it's part of the tradition of, like, I guess you could call it egalitarian liberalism. It believes in the full expression, or the full, again, the, the full uh, incorporation of all of humanity into citizenry. Like, everybody's capable of learning, everyone's capable of learning self-restraint and becoming responsible, so everyone's capable, no matter who, what, where, or maybe apart from kids, I mean, it's still even egalitarian liberalism. Everyone's capable of becoming a responsible citizen. There's a promise there, there's a, a promise of a particular kind of utopia. That people don't want to give up their stuff or make do with less, sacrifice what they have, for something that's perfectly reasonable, it's scientific, it's fact, it's peer reviewed for God's sake. It throws environmentalism into crisis as a political tradition. This is why the, the, the consumer, the mindless consumer, is such a problematic figure for environmental thought. Um, environmentalism is a vision of that, that scientific knowledge can be combined with a respect for the more than human world to produce a responsible citizen and a rational state. So framed this way, the, the failure of the movement to arrive is a failure of the li um, liberal political project. It's a failure of the liberal political vision. Um, it's basically a failure of democracy. Put that way. Democracy fails in this instance because people won't act like citizens. They just, they just keep buying stuff. I mean, people won't even take the threat seriously if you take um, Ten minutes or so. Oh, I'm going to speed up a bit. People want to take the threat seriously. Uh, they, they, you know, they don't even think climate change is as bad as it actually is. So, in this instance, where people are disappointing, the only thing you can turn to out of the two figures that we have is the state. Now, there has been a long commitment to state action or state-led action. There's been lots of debates around the state. Um, one of the uh, one debate that took place during the, the the middle of the, the movement in the UK uh, took place between uh, George Monbiot and a number of um, people in climate camp. We mentioned the other participants. Just looking at one. Um, so I'm going to quote uh, Monbiot's rationale for why the state should be used. Um, it's, it's worth um, reading in full. So this is George Monbiot. Now, in every other walk of life, you can be an anarchist, a statist, a communist. But with climate change, the problem is so pressing and so great. There's only really one ism that allows you to make the right decisions, and that's pragmatism. With climate change, we're faced with challenges that overwhelm any other political response. Unless there's a state that comes along to implement wider public policy, your individual action is meaningless. It only becomes meaningful in the context of wider public policy. Now, if volunteerism doesn't work, you require a degree of compulsion to have universal, across-the-board cuts. So what we is saying here is that the scale and the speed of climate change calls for making use of the state as an, in as an instrument, one that can compel people to cut their carbon emissions. Now, it's worth noting here that the state as an instrument is, is in a sense, as a fetish. 
uh, the state is actually a, quite a complex set of social relations that is concretized in a series of institutions. But the idea that it's a, a, a thing that can be taken up and used, uh, that's a fetish, but you know, it's a, a fetish perhaps of uh, just a, a suggestion of a particular class of people who, uh, I guess you could call it, say, uh, using other terminology, the professional managerial class, who have access to and the expectation of governing. So people who are used to commanding, organising, and managing. Now, behind this claim of the state is the idea that the state can act decisively, rapidly, um, that it can produce international agreements, that it's uh, uh, an actor that can intervene in the social, as it were, from above. Now, the key to this um, is that the state controls economic policy, that it can um, um, force change, that it, in a sense it has the, has the means of coercion at its disposal. It can force people to cut their consumption. Let's not get too invested in how unliberal it is to force people to change. Actually, the history of liberalism is full of forcing people to change. I think the history of colonialism in Australia is a perfect example of forcing people to change. Um, instead, let's just you know take Mamiotti's word and like, all right, just, you know, let's just, take, just assume the state is a thing that can be used. Just you know, put fetish and history on one side, um, and just we'll just use Mamiotti's criteria: pragmatism. Can the state be used this way? Can we just push a magic button, as the case may be, and turn the state on and then fix everything? I want to use an, I'm probably not going to end on this, the, um, an example from 2008 in the UK. Um, in 2008, after a long campaign, a climate change law was passed, the Climate Change Act. Um, and it mandated that the government cut its emissions. Uh, cut the emissions in the UK, the carbon emissions in the UK by 80% on 1990 levels by 2050. <clears throat> now, if there's a pragmatic case to be made around the state, you, you'll be able to say that this, this law is more or less successful, or you, know, you can say that this law is going to work or should work. The problem is that it's not. It's not working. Um, by one set of accounting, uh, the Committee on Climate Change, the government's um, more or less used up all its uh, initial plans for cutting carbon emissions. That the plan to cut carbon emissions has stalled, and that around 60% of carbon emissions, um, uh, uh, there's no plan for cutting emissions here. There's no plans for reducing emissions in agriculture, in housing, transport, industry. The government has no further plans. That's kind of stuck. And so it's not going to cut its emissions by 80% by 2050. I mean, it's, it's worth noting that the, the same commission also notes that, the same committee also notes that the government, the UK government's actively working against cutting carbon emissions by building a third runway, investing in fracking, by actively interfering in, um, uh, in international negotiations to, in order to make international agreements weaker than it could have otherwise been. It's worth noting that, the, that one of the reasons the even the reductions that have been made in the UK is deindustrialisation, which means that the UK has effectively over the past 20 years outsourced a lot of its carbon emissions. Now, if you use the, the figure of the consumer, problematic as it is, and you measure the carbon emissions bound to the objects and services uh, consumed in the UK, not just the ones produced in the UK, <coughs> carbon emissions have gone up by 20% since 1990 in the UK. Now, all of this, in a sense, is that, that, that carbon emissions have gone up rather than down. I mean, even if the, the law had been working, the carbon emissions that are required by law are still not enough according to the science. The, the carbon emissions required are 90% plus. And the rate is much more rapid, so we have to cut them much more quickly. So even if the law was working, it still wouldn't work. Just that right. Now, the, the failure of the state, you think, would lead to a sort of a deinvestment in it as a, as a means of achieving or securing change, but that hasn't happened. Uh, there's been no, you know, while people are disappointing, the state still, for some people, holds out hope. What I want to contend is that the, the, um, the maintenance of hope in the capacity of the state to be a tool of change is not accidental. 
Rather, the, sort of the, the fetishization of the state is the only means of maintaining liberal politics in a time of ecological uh, catastrophe. That people are disappointing doesn't mean you need to abandon the, the principles of um, you know, the power of reason, of education, of science. It just means you need to displace them onto another object, that object being the state itself. So the state is a means of maintaining liberal politics despite its lack of efficacy. Now, how does this operation work? Like, how, does the, how does the state become the repository of hope despite being disappointing in itself, despite failing? So what I want to say here is that uh, in a, it requires you know, rating the state as something captured, um, uh, as captured or corrupted by nefarious forces. Um, and the, this logic is quite similar to some of the logic of the, so the, the resurgent populist right, uh, in that there's a, there's, there's, the resurgent right thinks there's a national identity that's been captured, whereas I guess liberal liberals, or at least, at least radical liberals, would contend that the state has been captured. It's been captured by um, uh, neoliberal logic or old facts or um, corporate interests. This is probably the, the, uh, the most popular explanation of why the state won't be rational. Um, it's also the, uh, uh, an object, you know, or at least a target, you say that if we free the state of corporate influence, it will then act the way it should. It will then act reasonably, responsibly. It will implement you know, the, the, the policies and laws that we need to uh, arrest climate change. I'm obviously not going to like to critique the vision of the state here. Like it, the, you know, the state as rational instrument, instrument tools never actually existed. It's just a fantasy. I'm more interested in how the belief in the state is maintained, given its failure. Now, let's take up um, Lauren Balance's idea of cruel optimism. Um, now, Lauren Balance says that when there's a um, cause, cause the maintenance of a belief that's uh, that is. Um, Unrealizable. She says that you know, the persistence of this belief is, is cruel. It's a cruel form of optimism, thinking that the belief could be realized despite being unrealizable. It's a bind. It, you know, it's a, in the instance of the state, it's, a, it's a, the belief in the capacity of the state to act as a device to resolve climate change despite any lack of evidence that the state could resolve climate change, or will resolve climate change. It requires believing that at some point the state will be free to, to help us realise our, our, our hopes and dreams and faith. Now, cruel optimism isn't a false belief. It's not a false consciousness. It, it requires, it's like, the lot, it's like, lottery, like the lottery. It requires every now and then the state to do something right. It's like somebody wins the lottery every now and then. So when you buy a lottery ticket, you think that maybe you can win as well. So that's a form of cruel optimism. Because the chances are you're never going to win the lottery. But you keep doing something despite it being an unfulfilling action. Like it's a promise that won't be kept. The cruel optimism that, that, that's enveloped environmentalism is that, at least for a short period of time, the state was responsive to environmental campaigns. It was responsive to, to, to claims around science as it pertains to the, the, um, the more mainstream world. Um, the government has also been long entwined with science and expertise. Expertise is quite often, still is, intimately involved in governance. There's a, there's a, in some senses, there's a, a ground here for believing that the state could act reasonably and rationally. Now, in some ways we say that the, it's maintained in the ruins of social democracy. I mean, the Blair years were possibly the last time that environmentalism actually figured into governments in any prominent way, in a meaningful way. Um, but the maintenance and the educational lottery-like aspect of the realisation of environmental politics isn't really enough to maintain a, a, a state of cruel optimism. It also, meet, it also requires there being no other option. This is what I, I mentioned at the beginning, saying that there doesn't seem to be any other way of dealing with climate change except via the state. Now this is because of climate change. It's the problem here is the problem. Climate change is global. It, it comes from everything. It, 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 to change, to deal with climate change, you have to change everything. And you have to do it right now, starting quite literally today. What else could possibly do it other than the state? There's a bind here, and that's what maintains a, a state of cruel optimism. 
It's, it's inevitable the state will be called on to resolve climate change because people are disappointing. But the problem is because people are disappointing. There's, there's not going to be a social movement. There's not going to be any way to free the state or force it to act. And so the belief in the state gets and goes nowhere. Now, I'm sure if you have time to, to, to engage in sort of raising awareness and building capacity amongst you know, the broader public, perhaps environmentalism would. Maybe it, people wouldn't be so disappointing if there wasn't the threat of an imminent catastrophe. There's no time to have any faith in people. So in this way, you can sort of say that the persistence of belief in the state is a way of maintaining the tenets of liberalism despite people. But you still have to throw people under the bus to believe in the power of education and reason. So it produces a paradoxical situation. Environmentalists have to believe in facts, they have to believe in science, they have to believe in reason. They believe in sense, education and pedagogy because that's what animates their political beliefs. Yet that, that doesn't work. People won't be mobilised. So there's a displacement that takes place where you, know, you can turn to the state to impose rational governance. Then the state's disappointment in itself. The result of this bind and the current train is a, I guess you could call it a, a, a a dominant affect of professional optimism, where campaigners and journalists um, proclaim that there's still time to do something, but many um, hold to a more private sense of despair that nothing can be done. Even this professional optimism is breaking down. We find increasing numbers of scientists and journalists um, saying that nothing can be done, that there is no hope. People won't act, governments won't act, there's really nothing to be done. Done it in two minutes? All right. So at this point, I'm supposed to lay some claim as to why there's still hope. But there isn't any. Quite seriously, there's nothing. At least not within, um, or at least not as we currently understand it. Uh, there's no way to preserve the liberal political tradition. There's no way to maintain a faith in the power of education, science, and reason. Uh, you know, responsible individuals in a responsive state. There is no hope within this framework. And it's, it's interesting, sort of, you know, it's telling that sort of when people try to find some reason to be hopeful, they have to rely on yet to be invented technologies that will start carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to save us. But I would say that if we maybe shift register, we start from, uh, uh, start from the idea that we're already inhabiting the ruins of the present, that there are still possibilities for uh, other forms of life and other kinds of politics. And what I'll do is um, I'll end by suggesting three landmarks that we could possibly use to navigate um, the long present of climate change, because quite clearly there is no future. So I think the first thing is to note where the logic of the event has been refused, to give up on the idea of a, a historical sense of destiny or progress, to look for moments that matter or huge ruptures that change everything. If we look to uh, some of the current campaigns against infrastructure, uh, fracking, anti-fracking campaigns, anti-pipeline campaigns, what we see is not a commitment to a, a, a singular historical moment or something that will force a shift in everything, everywhere, but rather commitment to the very temporalities of wearing down infrastructure, of throwing sand in the gears. Here we sort of see a, um, a cacophony of frictions rather than a single planet. In a sense, this is, this is quite distinct from a notion of historical change. It's, a, it's quite different to long-standing notions of revolution. <coughs> it's a wearing down of the present on its overturning. This would lend itself to a, perhaps a second characteristic. Um, <coughs> resistance here is not self-governance. Resistance in these inst instance is not self-governance. It's being ungovernable. It's a refusal to go along the rules. It's an encampment. It's a refusal to be moved. It's, it's, to, it's to not do what you're told. It's to not behave. It's not even to be representable or even to make sense. To be ungovernable makes governance, it makes accumulation, it makes business as usual, impossible, through a, perform, uh, through, through a refusal to perform. This is closer to the mob than the citizen, in terms of the logic. 
I mean, as an aside, could we suggest that this is the very opposite of um, science? But we've kind of seen scientists go off the reservation for the past five years, engage in direct action, campaigns, going rogue on Twitter when, you know, when their departments get shut down in the US. I mean, and sort of Isabel Stenger's insights is that sort of field sciences, sciences like climate change science, actually don't produce tight, neat facts that can be deployed in terms of governance, but rather proliferate uncertainties about the way that we currently live. And this brings me to the final point. To throw sand in the gears and to be ungovernable foregrounds the question of how we are to live. And perhaps staying with the problematic figure of the consumer, it throws at the question of what it is that we desire. It means instead of thinking in terms of austerity and what we can't have, asking the difficult question of what it means to desire after the end of the world. And here the, the cruelty of liberalism and the, the the breaking or the shattering of our hopes, the sense, pervasive sense of hopelessness could be useful. What does it mean to dream when dreams are gone? What does it mean to want or hope when there is no future? How, you know, it foregrounds a sense of desire. What is it we actually want when what we want is cruel, is betrayed, doesn't exist? In some sense, the inability to realise existing desires, particularly bound, those bound to the reproduction of a of a cruel and exploitative society, create a bit of space to rethink what we want, to want otherwise, to desire otherwise, to dream otherwise. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. So, who's your question? Thank you. <clears throat> um, thanks, Nick. There wasn't actually too much I could disagree with that. Um, shocking. Yeah, shocking. Um, but obviously I'm going to say something. Do you, do you want to take that already? Or do you want to Watch do you mind being on the YouTube channel of this group? That's fine. Do you want me to go and sit there? I, no, I, oh, yeah. I can stop it after you talk. Okay. What's your move? I have to move. <coughs> So, um, one, one thing about surprise, I guess I've talked about 10 minutes, I think. Um, the blue, I was a bit surprised you, you kept mentioning blueprints, or mentioned blueprints several times. I haven't actually seen too many blueprints, certainly not about social reorganisation, lots of things like, you know, power of these electric cars and so on, but not about social reorganisation. So that was, you could maybe talk a bit, a bit more about that. Um, I think you're spot on in terms of the whole thing about this being a catastrophe, long violence, and it kind of makes me think about two other um, long events or periods of long violence, um, the African slave trade um, and the Holocaust. And, you know, the, the Hebrew word, Shoah, the Holocaust, means catastrophe. And the thing about the Holocaust is it didn't, it wasn't really a crisis for anybody. It was a catastrophe, but it wasn't a crisis. And with the African slave trade, I mean, that was kind of eventually ended by, um, you know, you know, innumerable slave revolts and so on. And that kind of maybe they're almost like the, the, what you talked about, the slow wearing down, the, grain, the, the grains of sand in the, in the infrastructure and so on. Um, and I think you're spot on when you talk about it. It's this thing about crisis. A crisis is only a crisis when it becomes a crisis for some subject. And when some subject, when some group of actors makes it a crisis. And I think that's what's interesting about climate change, why it's only a crisis when somebody makes it a crisis. So, and I think <coughs> you get that. Um, now on to the more critical stuff, which is, there's also an absence in your paper. And the absence is capital. You keep skirting around it. The closest you get is where you say, this is produced by mode of production. But you don't actually name it. And you talk about liberalism and the liberal project and liberal democracy, but we kind, of, we kind of know that that's kind of gone with Trump. But what hasn't gone is capitalism. And it's, it's almost like you're, you know, I, I know you know about capitalism, but it's almost like you're, you know, you're pulling, pulling punches there. And I, I'm, not, I'm not, quite sure, not quite sure why. Um, 
And that's interesting because when we think, start thinking about capital and the capital relationship, it kind of makes you know, George Monbiot's sort of insight that we're kind of a movement against climate change is a movement against ourselves. But it's only against a part of ourselves because you know, the work of John Holloway here who talks about the capital relationship not as a kind of an external relationship between a proletariat here and a, and a capitalist class here, but as the capital relation is something that kind of goes through us. So in that sense, the movement against climate change understood as whether, you know, against the capitalist mode of production or consumption is a movement against that part, part of ourselves. So maybe bringing capital in kind of give us a clearer understanding of kind of what, what, the, what the task is. Um, also, I, I kind of share your, your, under, your, your, your anti-state, um, what, anti-state kind of sensibility. Sorry, I'm really full of flu, so I'm, I'm a bit hard to make sense. Um, but I think your understanding of the state is still a little bit too thing-like. Mm -hmm. So, your criticism of liberal democracy is that the state is this tool that we can use, and you reject that, which I agree with. But you're still accepting their understanding of the state as a thing. Whereas again, if you know, if we go work the work of John Holloway and Werner Bonefeld, you know, their understanding of the state as a as a moment, a moment of class struggle. So I, I, I still think you're right, but I think the understanding of the state needs to be a, a bit nuanced. And it's also interesting there because you know that 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 the period that you've most been talking about since um you know since since the, the turn of the millennium. We've also kind of seen this so-called electoral turn in, in social movements. And that's, so it's, it's almost like more people are starting to have this, I don't know if it's a faith, but it's sort of some, you know, optimism that the state can do something. So, you know, from my life in 1987, I campaigned for the Labour Party and had people, anarchists, telling me, you should not vote, don't ever vote. You know, and 30 years later, the same people, sometimes the same people were telling me, oh, you've got to vote Labour, you've got to vote Labour, you know, and joining the Labour Party, and I, I don't understand that. Um, finally, um, oh, sorry, I mentioned Trump. I think Trump's interesting because you, you mentioned the, um, well, you called it the anti-globalisation movement. I never called it the anti-globalisation movement, I called it the alter of the counter-globalisation movement. And that's kind of interesting because we, you know, we can see the power of that movement in Trump. You know, we argued against NAFTA. You know, that's when the Zapatistas you know, rose up. On the, the, the day NAFTA came into effect, and two decades later, you know, we are seeing the President of the United States saying that NAFTA is the most terrible you know, trade deal ever. And so that's... You know, that, I think that kind of shows the, you know, the fucked up power of social movements. Obviously it's been turned against us, but um, that's kind of an interesting aside. Finally, to finish, um, kind of coming back to the, the thing about you know, notions of temporality. Um, and again, I kind of think, in a sense, you're kind of, you could go further and you're pulling punches a little bit here. Because this, you're arguing against a, a linear notion of time, really, I think, you're arguing against against progress, and you're arguing against growth, and you're arguing against the economy, and that's kind of we need to be clearer against that. <clears throat>